Welcome everybody, this is the Fly Culture Podcast and I'm your host, Pete Tigers. My guest today first started working in fishing in 1969 and has taught thousands of people to fish over this time. He has seen much since then and I hope to get an insight along with a few stories too. Hardly surprisingly, I've had a number of requests to get him along from listeners of the podcast. I'm now pleased to welcome David Pilkington to the Fly Culture Podcast. David, it's great to have you along. How are you doing, sir? Well, I'm doing okay. I'm delighted to still be here, still fishing, still teaching at the Arundel, which is something I've done for a long time now. And so tell us exactly for our listeners where we are today. We are in the new Field and Stream Tackle Shop uh, at the Arundel. Uh, We are now stocking Orvis Tackle, and this is our headquarters for fishermen to come in the morning, get advice on beats, river conditions, buy a few flies, hire some stuff if necessary, and get uh, advised on where to go and what to do. And for listeners not knowing, I'm sure many of them will do know, that the history of the Arundel how long have you been involved with it? I said in the introduction, is 1969 about right? It's about right. I, in fact, first came to the hotel in 1968. I was working then as a trainee water bailiff for what was at the time the Cornwall River Authority. Um, I was apprenticed to Roy Buckingham, who was also working as a bailiff for the River Authority. Um, and we used to pop in the hotel, uh, check people's licenses on the hotel water, So I knew the hotel from 1968, and then Roy left the River Authority and came to work at the hotel full-time in 1969. And in fact, in that summer, um, he asked if I would help him out on the beginner's courses, because once it was known that the hotel had a resident uh, experienced casting instructor, um, the demand grew exponentially, and Roy was basically swamped. So he asked me if I would do a few days uh, back then, we only did four four day courses in the whole season: one in the Easter holidays, one at Whitson, and one in the summer. Um, we do more than that now, and we've we're full time teaching uh, a lot of the season now. But that was my first experience of the hotel. It was run at that time by Ann and Gerald Fox Edwards. Um, dear old Gerald was a nice old boy. Uh, he was in poor health, and he died about nineteen seventy. Um, after which um, Anne remarried to Conrad Vosbark, who was the first ever dedicated BBC parliamentary broadcaster with his own slot on the nine o'clock news, as it was, uh, fishing correspondent for The Times, author of several books and first class gentleman. And what was it like walking through those doors for the first time? Because I guess at that time, as you said, that you were along to help out. How did that feel for for you for that first time? Well, it was a great privilege. And I mean, at the age of 18 or 19, you know everything, don't you? So um, I soon learned that I didn't. And in fact, I learned a huge amount by teaching because people would, you know, make a cast and say to me, what's wrong with that? And I had to look at it carefully, analyse it and think, well, yes, I know what's wrong with it. I'll explain it to you. Nearly everybody bends a wrist and goes too far back. A lot of people reach out on the forward cast. A lot of people work much too hard at it. Um, yeah, nothing's changed there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the same old thoughts, isn't it? And I guess from an instruction point of view, was there sort of qualifications at that time or, or was it you were sort of figuring it out as you uh, you went along and, like you say, learning by teaching and seeing those constant errors that were keep coming up? In the early years, yes, I was learning by teaching. Um, but I was offered to come and join Roy here on a full-time basis in 1976, which was a momentous year because I started working here. Uh, it was the year of the famous drought, which I remember very well, and also the year in which I got married. So I, I remember it equally well. Um, and it was then in the 70s, 76, probably 77, 78, no later, um, that the... Uh, Association of Professional Game Angling Instructors was formed at the time under the auspices of of the late Colonel Esmond Drury, inventor of the famous treble hook. Um, So Roy and I both went up to York uh, to take our exams to qualify as professional instructors. Um, We were in the company of Arthur Oglesby, Jack Martin, 
uh, and many like um, Peter Mackenzie Phelps, I mean, some real greats out of the fly fishing world. And Jack Martin said something to me, which I will never forget. He looked at me quite seriously in, in a fatherly sort of way. I mean, I would have been in my mid, late twenties. He said, you, he said, are a medium sized frog in a small pond. But he said, you're now entering a big pond with big frogs. <laughs> And for you, did that feel then that was your life always destined to be in fishing or were you going in a different direction and then the, these situations came about for you? Well, I think there was a series of fortunate coincidences which have obviously helped me along. But all I ever wanted to do since my early days at school was just go fishing. Um, when I first left school, I was at Newton Abbott Grammar School I walked out of the door on a sunny July day in 1966 and it was literally just before my 16th birthday uh, and I then went straight into the drum sports tackle shop in Newton Abbott and helped out selling fishing tackle. Um, my family then moved a bit further west into the wild wilds of Cornwall and uh, my dear mother saw a job as a trainee water bailiff advertised in the Western Morning News, which I applied for, uh, managed to get the position, and I started working for the Cornwall Authority in February 1967, uh, while I was still 16. So when this role came up, it must have been an absolute dream for you, wasn't it? It was. And I mean, I just absorbed everything. I mean, we did a lot of uh, we did a lot of hatchery work. We did a lot of fish rescue work, a lot of electro fishing. Um, I was apprenticed to Roy Buckingham in 1968, but prior to that, I spent some time with dear old Bill Sprent on the Tavy Walkham and Plym catchment, and Bill taught me a great deal. We used to fish Burrator Reservoir. Um, he managed to get me permission from various landowners to fish bits on the Tavy and the Walkham. Um, so I was absorbed and consumed by fishing and all things fishy um, forever. <laughs> And do you think, you know, we're still, like you say, in this wonderful tackle shop at the moment, do you sit here now and think, wow, that was some time ago and I'm still here and you've enjoyed every second of it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I would say you're right. I mean, I, I can't imagine anything better than being out on a, a natural river, a, a freestone stream, draining the hills of Devon and Cornwall, fishing for native wild brown trout, uh, sea trout, and occasionally even a dear old salmon or two, which are sadly not around as they were 50 years ago. And I guess that's an interesting uh, segue you've taken us on because the fishing must have changed quite dramatically from when you first started. Has it changed really noticeably or has it been a gradual change? It's been gradual, but it's, it's progressive. I mean, when I came here first, uh, everybody thought the, the resource of the Atlantic salmon was, was endless and everybody killed everything they caught without, uh, you know, without compunction. And, and the river was full of fish. I mean, if Roy and I went to the river to try and catch a salmon, we would never go without a dustbin liner to put the fish in and carry them home. Um, as time has gone on and the salmon have declined everywhere, um, we've now gone for complete catch and release. Um, and the serious salmon killers who were mostly spinning um, and smacking everything on the head, and some people still even carried a gaff in the early days, um, that's changed completely now. I mean, nobody would dream of killing a wild Atlantic salmon uh, on our water because we would shoot them on the spot. <laughs> um, and we also release all our trout, all our sea trout. One of the things that has changed significantly is the interest in grayling. I mean, the grayling have been in the Tamer system since the Dukes of Bedford put them in at the very end of the 19th century and are in every tributary in the main river on the Tamer catchment. And we now fish for grayling through the winter months, which certainly when I came here first was just never done. At the end of the drought season, you put your rods away and didn't take them out till next March. But now we fish right through, assuming it's not in full flood, which <laughs> this winter it has been quite a lot. What do you think the grayling have, have gained in popularity? Is it simply because it is an extension of the season for people? It's not only that, they're also a truly wild fish. Um, there's no stocking of grayling at all. Grayling are not put in put and take waters, so they're a completely wild fish in every way. And I think they're lovely fish, and the fact that they extend the season, I mean, a nice day in October, November, or even December, 
out on the river is is completely magic. Uh, you will inevitably catch a few out of season brown trout and indeed out of season sea trout. And <laughs> I have managed to catch so far three salmon on my four or five weight rod and three or four pound nylon when I'm nymphing for grayling, which is a rather interesting experience. Yeah, they can be quite lively, can't they? Um, it's too soon to be talking legacies, um, but you've got so many people into fly fishing. You must be incredibly proud of that. Yes, I am. I mean, fly fishing is just such a nice thing uh, to impart to people. And and something I've noticed here over the years, I mean, probably the bulk of the guests at the hotel are sort of London home counties based, and they're living in a much more sort of urban uh, environment you know they, they they commute to work on trains they go up and down in lifts they talk on computers and phones so the countryside to some people is, is is a rather strange place and just introducing people to what we still have down in here which is which is you know beautiful rivers beautiful valleys um, natural water wild stocks of fish it's a special thing and, and to m- many people actually get it that's the that's the really nice part of it when when you can see the the light lifting from someone's eyes and they can suddenly think oh yeah there's a fly hatching there and there's a little nymph crawling on that stone and oh there's a trout just risen it, it's a magic thing it's a magic thing and to be able to impart that to people and see them actually like i say getting it and understanding it um and the other thing that springs naturally from that is these people will then value the wild environment and, and, and the, the cleaner waters, which are these days becoming, you know, threatened from every direction. And I've had Tim Smith on the podcast and he said about uh, the history of the fishing here. But they've also had from a tuition standpoint, people who have come as a young man and then subsequently grown up a little bit, brought their son and then further down the line, some grandson or grandchildren oh. along into fishing. You must have seen a fair bit of that. Oh, very much so. I have definitely had the privilege of teaching the grandchildren of people that I taught to fish here back in the back in the 1970s. And yeah, it's a rather nice continuity. And it's nice to know that there are still young people coming into fishing because it's, it gives you such a lovely insight into nature in general and appreciate of life and, and indeed death. Um, you know, trout are predators, they eat stuff, they kill stuff. Uh, we as human beings kill stuff, although on the rivers these days we let everything go. But it gives them a focus on, on, a, on a broader picture of life in general. And it's interesting what you said about the uh, bringing young people into fishing. Do you think that has changed a little bit from when you first started? And I saw not so long ago uh, the film, I think, that quoted angling as the biggest participation sport. And I think that was in the 1950s. But have you seen an erosion in numbers of anglers or do you think it's been pretty constant? And We are just a, a smart, small little minute aspect of outdoor sports. Yeah, it's difficult to really say, but if you talk to anybody involved in any sort of field sporting activity, uh, there does seem to be a strong feeling that there is a lack of youngsters coming into it these days. Again, more and more people live in largely urban environments, don't have that connection with the countryside. And kids these days just want to play on their phones and computers. Um, And I think to get back to the reality of life, to feel water running around your feet, to feel the water cold if you put your hand in, to see a fish rising is a very special thing. And, and, and we should, well, we are trying um, to get more children into it. And I love it when I, when parents bring their children and I can show them these things. Children also, um, to learn to cast a fly is not something that you can do when you're a very tiny child. But once they get to the ages of 10 or 11 and have better physical coordination and the ability to concentrate a bit better, um, Teaching children is a joy because they listen to what you say. Um, and many, many times we've had a whole family here, mum, dad and a couple of kids. And in the course of an hour or two's instruction, the children are putting out a beautiful line and the parents are still struggling a bit. Yeah, they're used to being taught, I guess, aren't they, um, children? So that that aspect of classroom or whatever that may be, if that classroom is actually on the river, river or the lake, but they're used to learning. Do you think that's something to do with it? Oh, I'm sure it is. They're they're just more receptive to ideas in general. Um, Hopefully they still respect their elders and listen to what you say and know that you you do know plenty about what you're talking about and can appreciate that fact. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I find children easy to teach, but not the very, very young ones. They want to be, you know, 10 plus. And from then on, you're, you're, you're sowing on fertile ground. And a lot of kids that if the child has a, a genuine interest in wildlife and the countryside in general, um, you, you know you're onto a winner. And does that mean that the phone stays in the pocket or stays off and it's quite pleasing for you to see that, that you've pulled them away into the real world for a short time? Very pleasing, yes. Certainly when they're fishing, their mind is so switched on to what they're doing, um, there's, there's no room for anything else. And I wanted to move on to your role a little bit because, of course, it's not just instruction and guiding uh, and the shop here as well. There are also beats to maintain. Do you enjoy that aspect of it? Because I look at your and I follow you on social media, on Instagram, and really enjoy your posts about the wider outdoors. You're talking about uh, flowers, trees, everything about how nature is waking up. Is that a fun part for you as well? Oh, absolutely. Hugely so. Um, I really enjoy doing a bit of work on a piece of river, doing a bit of trimming and making the access easier and better and safer in this age of health and safety and ambulance chasing lawyers and all. Um, so we like to keep the water in good order and that's that's a big part of my job. Um, I've got one or two other chaps here that will come and help me because I'm not getting any younger these days and unfortunately the trees grow just as fast as they ever did. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the maintenance of the river and just being out there on the river is magic. And if I'm completely exhausted by swinging a swimmer for a couple of hours, I'm sweating like a pig, then I just sit down on the riverbank, chill out, enjoy it and watch a few trout rise. Fantastic. And being on the river, you're getting a feel of it the whole time. And there's probably nobody more immersed into the West Country rivers than yourself. And you'll say that you'll sit by the river for a little bit. Does that mean from hatches and insect life, are you seeing changes there or have they been sort of kind of constant for you? I would say some of the fly hatches have dwindled away a bit. Um, I can't remember when I last saw any iron blues. And there was a time when we used to get big hatches of iron blues. And as you read in all the, the older fly fishing books, when the iron blues hatch, the fish absolutely love them. Um, but we still get quite a decent hatch of fly. And there is also a lot of work being done by organisations like the West Country Rivers Trust, uh, Fish Legal and everybody else to try and keep the waters not polluted and, and promote, you know, everything that, that we as fishermen value highly. How do you see the state of the rivers comparable from a pollution standpoint from when you first started up until today? Well, as I say, there are a lot of people doing a lot of work. But there is absolutely no doubt about it that the, the encroach of mankind on the environment in every single way uh, is, is not doing it any good. And the more you know about it, the more you understand about it, the more worrying that is. But fortunately, a lot of people are becoming increasingly aware of these problems uh, and, and trying to address them. Do you worry about that? I do worry about it because it's a, it's a, a very big thing, which I... I'm just one very small cog and, and, and can't really do much about. I mean, I support most of the angling charities and, and conservation bodies, uh, as most fishermen should. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my bit there. And I mean, I'm forever picking up litter on the riverbank and, and trying to make the place, you know, keep it nice. And you mentioned about rising trout and you like to sit in, uh, by the river, see a few fish move. I saw yesterday, we're at the back end of March, and I saw my first granum on the river. When do you start to see fish rise? There are granum about um, as early as, as end of February, early March, especially if you get some mild days. But our fish don't tend to take a huge amount of interest in the granum. I mean, I've fished the usk when the, the granum were hatching like a blizzard and you could, you could barely see the far bank of the river on the other side. Um, but we do get granum. The other flies are large dark olive and they're still hatching well. I saw them when I was on the river in both January and February, uh, but they hatch in greater numbers now and that will certainly bring a few fish up. We just want some warmer weather, a bit more settled, rivers to drop a bit and, and you will catch rising fish. Do you have many or do you have a favourite hatch? Not really, no. One of the flies that I, I, I have... Uh, specialised is, is, is giving myself too much credit. Um, I tie an imitation of the egg laying stone flies. We get a hatch of stone flies in the late summer. They start about mid August. 
and go right through into October, even November. Um, and the egg-laying females have got a little mustard yellow egg sac at the tail of their abdomen and fly over the water. And very often they'll actually uh, let the egg sac slip. Now, I never know whether they do this intentionally or accidentally. And I've seen this tiny little pinhead-sized lump of life hit the water and then start to break up into smaller pieces as it sinks. And I've seen a salmon par of that year, which would be two, two and a half inches long, rise up and swallow the, the biggest lump of eggs as they settle down. But I tie my own imitation of the egg-laying stonefly because the flies will ultimately fall onto the water and their life's purpose is then finished and they are, they are spent and they often have their wings in all sorts of odd angles and disarray. And, and when I get a fish rise and take my, my own imitation egg-laying stonefly, boy, am I smug. Nice. I like the sound of that. And it's interesting that you mentioned stonefly because it's not a necessarily uh, a fly that we think a great deal about. Funnily enough, I think I saw some alder fly. Would that be right? Yes, a uh, couple of days ago as, as well. And I've seen fish on the X eating those, but I've not seen so many eat stoneflies. So that's a wonderful observation. Perhaps you'd tell us a little bit about that pattern as well in case listeners have a stonefly hatch that they might want to take advantage of. Well, the stoneflies are definitely more numerous on the rocky rivers, such as we have in the West Country. Um, and if you read many of the classic books that were written by the chalk stream anglers of yesteryear, they hardly give stoneflies a mention because they're less common on those waters. I mean, they're, they're happier on the rocky rivers, the slightly more acidic, slightly lower pH waters. But to certainly to our trout on the entire Tamer catchment, all the tributaries, the, the stoneflies in the late summer and into the autumn are a significant food item um, and sometimes they're, they're about the only fly that's really around on the surface to bring fish up at that time of year and I just tie a simple imitation uh, I mean the stone fly is a sort of a grey dull coloured fly so I make a, a body of a bit of grey dubbed fur a little lump of, of uh, yellow fur at the tail as, a, as a, an egg ball um, and a hackle of sort of dark dun hackle or something like that and perhaps a wing of of uh, of teal or mallard uh, primary, which is a dull grey blay, as it used to be called in the famous blay and black. Um, like I say, I'm, I'm, I don't pretend to be an expert in entomology or fly tying, but uh, when it works, it's very satisfying. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I've also noticed, certainly where I fish on the tour, a fair few more yellow sallies as well. Have you seen that, or they've been a constant for you? No, yellow sallies have all been around. There's two. There's a quite small one and a larger one. And fish will take them, but they never hatch in a, in, in a large number. I think the small stone flies, which we get, which are actually, I think, technically needle flies, if you want to split hairs, um, are definitely the, the one that the fish really lock on to in the, in the late summer and in the autumn. I wanted to move on a little bit now. And I had a friend in the car the other day, and we were driving along the A377, which follows the tour a lot of the way, and I was pointing out places that used to be fishing hotels. And there's a lovely one that used to be the Fort Skew Arms that the owner, it's where the junction of the junction tour and, and the, the mole, mole yeah, absolutely met. And it, it was legendary that the owner could tell the difference between a mole fish and a tour fish as well. But that's no longer there and it hasn't been there for quite some time. Why do you think the Arundel has outlasted just about everyone in this part of the world? That's a pretty good question to which I can't really give an answer. I think one of the um, overriding factors is that we actually control fishing. We own fishing rights and control fishing rights on a very large uh, length of water. We've got about 22 miles of river that we can fish. We've got the Tamer, um, its main tributary, the Lid, tributary of that, the Thrushel, tributary of that, the Wolf tributary of the upper lid, uh, the Lou, L-E-W, as in Lou Down and Lou Trenchard, not North Lou, different river. Um, and we also have fishing on the River Ottery out in Cornwall, which is a lovely little trout stream quite close to my house. So we're able to offer fishing for about 20 people on individual beats, uh, which makes us bigger than most fishing hotels. But we are suffering from the same thing that all hospitality is at the moment, a lot of people don't have spare money and, and you know, it could be better. It could definitely be, we'd like some more fishermen. Do you think it is, to me, the Arundel's sort of woven into the tapestry of fly fishing 
and so many people around it, around the UK, know of it. It may be the articles that you have written and, and many others. It may be the books. And it is just synonymous with the fishing here. Do you think that has always, it's because it's always been here that it's it, people know it so well? I think it is. I mean, we've been a fishing hotel um, certainly since the 1930s. So we are very well established. Um, and we've messed, you know, we've had a lot of people through our doors over the years. And, and I think it, it's easy to get a bad reputation. It's harder to get a good one. But having, having achieved a good reputation, you've got to work hard to keep it. Um, and the present owners are very keen that we do exactly that. And, and things are definitely moving forward. In the last few years with the new owners, we've taken on some more fishing, some extra water. We now have the river lid at Sydenham where we control three miles of the river or two miles of the river in, in three different beats, which is a lovely bit of trout water. And in fact, one of our instructors fished over the weekend and caught plenty of trout, some grayling and some sea trout smolts. He had a very good day. Yeah, it's that nice mix as well. And I've had Simon Goresworth on the podcast a couple of times, actually, and we talked about his father's business and how they got a chef down from London for everybody. And I know sort of obviously the fox and the hounds of old as well, whereas it used to be you'd sort of sit around a big table at dinner time and everyone would sh- sit on the table and share stories of the day. Was that how that was happening here as well at the time? No, I don't think we ever had a big table because often, you know, fishermen would come with their wives who weren't fishing, so they'd do other things. Um, but on a, on, a, on a fishing course, when we have a group of people that are sort of thrown together from sometimes slightly different walks of life, if they obviously click and gel together, which, which is immediately apparent if they do, um, they will often then choose to eat together uh, at dinner that night. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a nice thing. Um, and we've, we've had groups on courses who came and met on courses and have continued to correspond and, and, and visit each other and fish together uh, through many years. So it's a, that's a nice part of it. What so far has been your highlight of being involved with the Arundel? Oh, Lord above. That's, that's a very difficult one to answer. I think it's just, you know, meeting people, talking, fishing, uh, guiding them on water, teaching them how to cast, seeing them progress and improve, and seeing them appreciate what our rivers can offer and, and you know, what the West Country has to offer in general. Is there a pride in that as well, when people come down to experience the rivers for the first time and, like you said earlier, get what it's about? Is there something nice for you about that as well? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a deep satisfaction, deep satisfaction. So I wanted to move on just a little bit now, and I was talking to Tim Smith, who you work with just the other day, and he told me to ask you to tell me the story about two rock stars, a Bentley and a forgotten handbrake. Are you allowed to expand on this? I will expand on this. I will not mention them by name because I think a lot of these folks don't like their fans to know that they enjoy shooting pheasants, which was exactly why they were here in the winter months. Um, But there was a gentleman staying at the hotel at the same time who had a large Bentley. He parked it slightly uphill from the main doors of the hotel and he'd been out to the car during breakfast. And when he went back in, it decided the handbrake was going to malfunction and it slid gently, but with about a ton of metal behind it, and blocked the main doors of the hotel. Um, at exactly the same time, as a large bunch of very famous rock stars and musicians were just heading out to go on a day's pheasant shooting. Uh, so there was the hilarious sight of these, the great and the good of, of, of rock and pop music, with their shoulders to the front of this car, pushing the damn thing up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. I would have paid money to watch that. But thank you for not mentioning. Well, I should say thank you on behalf of them anyway for not mentioning who it was. Um, as somebody who's so deeply involved in fishing, has it been, and I know the answer to this because we're sitting here talking, but is it very, could it be easy to fall out of love with it? Yeah, I suppose it could, but I, I've certainly never done that myself. And, and and an awful lot of the people that come here have fished with us for years and still do and love it deeply. I think I think once you really, you know, get a get a love for fly fishing and, and the rivers in general, 
it's something you're never going to lose. My son, who is a petrol head and loves his cars, um, fished with me as a little boy and enjoyed it. He caught sea trout on a fly at night. Uh, he's caught a few salmon. And he still enjoys his fishing, but doesn't get much time because he's a hard-working lad. Um, but we had a, a week in Scotland with him and his wife a few years ago. And having fished during the day, at dinner that night, my son looked at me quite seriously. He said, you know, Dad, I've forgotten how much I enjoy this fly fishing. And I think it's something that you, you will never lose. And certainly he will never lose it. And uh, we're going to have a week in Iceland later this year. Wow. Not jealous at all. That's the, an interesting point you make. My daughter grew up with a fly rod in her hand and drifted away from it. And it's very easy to try and force your passion, your pastime, or in your case, your I guess your job as well, onto your children. It, it, you sometimes have to let them drift away from it to, to come back, don't you? Yeah, I'm sure. And I mean, my, my son went to uh, school, uh, went to university, um, did four years, worked jolly hard, got himself a master's degree, and then got himself a job and a career at which he's worked hard ever since. But he's never lost the fact that a day on the river is, is a total unwinding. There's no phones, there's no computers, and nobody hassling you with, with, with the things. And, and he can see that that is still a fine thing to do. And I'm pretty sure uh as as time goes on he probably will do more fishing and i've certainly seen people coming back to me from uh from a, a life and a business and work and everything um to get back into fishing something which some of them may not have done since a child yeah let's come on to your fishing what is your favorite species <sighs> well i like them all i love the little wild brown trout i mean the, the brown trout of the devon streams never have been big fish if you want big big trout you're in the wrong part of the world, although there are a few better ones here and there. Um, but they're just such fun to catch. Um, I think I have to say the sea trout is really my very favourite fish. The season for them when they're at their peak is relatively short, so it's a it's a precious time. Uh, you fish at night, which in itself is a totally magic experience. I was night fishing for sea trout when I was only in my early teens, and I've never lost the love and the and the magic of a night on the river catching sea trout. They're bigger than the wild brownies because they've been to sea, they're fed, they've grown much larger. They fight in a in a, a unique way. They are so fast and so lively. Um, yeah, I would say the sea trout is my special fish, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy fishing for lots and lots of other species. How do you like to fish for sea trout most? Would you fish a surface lure or do you, your pilks bumble as well, I guess? Yeah, I'm not really a great fan of surface lures because um, if you're fishing a pool containing a shoal of fish, which you are, um, the surface lure, I think, yes, it will catch you a fish or two, but I think it also disturbs them and upsets them. And I would I would certainly not like to fish um, the night following one when I knew somebody had been whacking a big surface lure, dragging it across the pool that I wanted to fish, um, the next night. So uh, a conventional wet fly, a large fly, often sized long shank four, long shank six, really quite a big fly with a palmered hackle like my Pilks Bumble, um, which presents not just a, a visual target for the fish, but creates a wake and a turbulence in the water that they feel. I'm sure they feel it as well as see it in the darkness. Um, and that catches plenty of fish for me. I will put on a surface lure occasionally and just have a few casts at the end of the night in desperation, but uh, I'm getting a bit old for staying out very late these days. I'm with you on that, I have to say. <laughs> I often talk on here about evolution of anglers and how we're changing a little bit and how we're looking for these other species. And I know I've tried to wave from you from the other side when you're fishing for bass, and you're very quick to adopt that and see that there was potential, A, to catch them on a fly, and also to take people out after them. Has that been a fun process for you? Very fun process. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I fished in the sea with bait um, from a very early age and love beach casting and estuary fishing with peeler crab and natural baits and digging my own bait and everything, and, and, and still do. Um, and I fly fish most of my life as well, but I never put the two together 
until the late 1990s. Uh, we moved house, which took us much closer to the North Cornish coast. And I teamed up with a local chap who was a mad keen lure fisherman who took me and showed me a few bass fishing spots. And I caught a few bass on, on spinners and lures. And I'd been reading about bass fishing on a fly and I thought, well, yeah, do it. So I literally went to a place on the North Cornish coast, totally on my own with a fly rod in my hand, feeling a bit silly, to be honest. And thank the good Lord, I hooked a bass within about 10 or 15 minutes of starting. And it was a school bass, about a pound, pound and a bit, perfectly nice fish, fought hard, fought very well on the fly rod. But while that fish was being played in the clear Atlantic water, it was being shadowed by a much bigger fish, a bass of about three or four pounds. And I thought, wow, this is magic. And shortly afterwards, I hooked a much heavier, more solid fish. And I thought, yippee, I'm in that big three or four pounder. And that fish turned out to be a ballon ras. And the crazy thing there is, although I've fly fished in the sea a huge amount since then, it is the only ras I've ever caught on a fly. And I caught it on the very first time I ever fished to fly in the sea. Slightly crazy. I've now caught 16 different marine species on the fly right here in Devon and Cornwall, uh, virtually all of them from the shore. So it's a, it's a big subject. Uh, it's still being explored and it's one hell of a lot of fun. The other thing particularly is the sea fishing is at its best in the middle of the summer when the rivers are often very low, temperatures are high, dissolved oxygen is low and the fishing can get a bit tough. But the saltwater fish, it cannot be too hot for them. They love the warm water. It produces food, algae, brit, plankton, everything's feeding. Great stuff. And how about mullet? Because mullet are a popular species um, over the last few years as well, helped by Colin, Paul and, and many others as well. Is that a species that you're interested in catching? I'm interested in catching, but they're not interested in being caught by me. Um, <laughs> I have I have read Colin McLeod's book. I've digested it cover to cover, and it's all very good stuff. Um, but I still find them pretty damn difficult. I have caught them on a fly, fair and square in the mouth. I've also foul hooked them by accident when I've been bass fishing. Um, I mean, they're great fish. They fight with incredible speed. They are very, very lovely fish. Yeah, they're great fun to fish for. And like you say, I think where we go, they they seem to be really difficult to tempt. I found somewhere else a little bit away from there that I've had a little bit more success. But I think, do you think it is the challenge of them for somebody like yourself, who's a guide as well to, to figure out that species and learn a little bit more about them. And it's always pleasing when you actually hook into one as well. Oh, they're wonderful. <clears throat> they're wonderful fish when you hook one. Um, yeah, it, it is a subject which is, is fascinating. It's intriguing. And there's still a lot of mystery about it. So I freely admit, I, I wouldn't attempt to take anybody out and say, I am an expert mother fisherman, let me show you how to catch one, because I would fall flat on my face in the estuary mud. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to move on a little bit now. And you've seen, we're sitting in the office here, and I can see, I think, some bamboo rods, various graphite ones as well, all sorts of stuff. As somebody who has the high-level casting qualification... Rods, you must have seen some dramatic changes in those over the years. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the, 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 the development of tackle has, has been moving on and is, is, is still being pursued by the, uh, the manufacturers. There are some lovely rods about now. And, I mean, if you want to pay over £1,000, there are single-handed trout rods for sale in our shop right now. Um, but you can still get stuff at a much more reasonable price, which is very, very usable. So, yeah, tackle has moved on. Um, I don't know how much further it can go. I mean, I remember when uh, carbon first came out, it was expensive at the time. People said it was prone to breakage, but I've never really found that. Um, and then somebody started developing rods out of boron and Kevlar. They seem to have come and gone. Um, there is a current resurgence for fiberglass rods, um, those I've handled, I'm not particularly impressed with, but if you want to use one, <clears throat> please do. I still possess a few cane rods, and one of our guests very kindly made for me a little six and a half foot cane rod as a gift last year. 
which is a joy to use on the small streams. It's really, uh, uh, yeah, it's a nice piece of kit. But it's it's cane is definitely it's a heavier material. But in the smaller sizes where the weight is is not relevant, it's it's nice to use. But uh, no, I've got some good carbon rods, and I, I I still enjoy those. I've got a little seven foot sage uh, light trout rod. Love it. Four weight, perfect. What do you think over from the moment that you first stepped through the doors at the Arundel has been the biggest change that you've seen in fly fishing from a tackle perspective? I know we've talked about the changes in rods. Would it be that or would it be something else that you thought this was an absolute game changer? Not really. I mean, carbon was a game changer in as much that it made a much lighter rod. And now that the you know wider range of manufacturers producing them, the the previously very high price has dropped down to a, a more reasonable level. Um, no, nothing, nothing, nothing very dramatic, really. So you've just gone with the flow from the changes as they they happen. Yeah, yeah, go with the flow like a dry fly. Lovely, lovely. So you're going to Iceland this year, um, which sounds very, very exciting. What else have you got planned? Nothing much, really. Um, the Icelandic trip is absolutely going to be a trip of a lifetime. I've drawn some money out of my savings and my children will be forever inheriting a lot less. Um, but we're hoping for some fun. Um, but I'm looking forward to the season ahead. I still love my dry fly for the little wild brownies on these little rivers. Uh, a few nights with the sea trout, a few days up on the coast for the bass. I'm, I'm looking forward to it all. Are you somebody, and we had rain overnight, and I know we were talking before we started recording, are, are you somebody who, when that rain's falling, when you're laying in bed, it sort of wakes you up and you're thinking, right, we're going to have to take people here or we're going to have to put them here. Do you think about those things or you, you're so used to it, you've got a plan anyway? No, constantly, because it changes literally overnight, so you need to keep your fingers switched on. Um, we're lucky here that we've got fishing on six different rivers, some of them drain farmland and get very, very coloured on a spate and are unfishable for days at a time. We've got the River Lid, which comes off Dartmoor. That will fall and clear much more quickly. Um, the problem right now is is just the volume. The ground is so wet after a very wet winter that the rivers are all holding and keeping at a, a, a high level. But they are settling down. And of course, every day now, the sun's higher in the sky. Transpiration is pulling more water out of the ground. And so the rivers will drop a little bit more quickly and we'll get back to fishing quite soon. And do you like to fish up on Dartmoor? I love the Dartmoor streams. I've never really explored them as much as I would uh, like to. I've always had so much closer to home here. But no, they're lovely streams. And of course, the nice thing about Dartmoor, even though, you know, there's thousands and thousands of visitors in the summer, if you just actually walk, you can have the place to yourself and you can catch little wild trout in totally natural rivers. Yeah, it's great fun. It's a nice place. And has it been hard? I guess it's hard, like you say, to drag you away from these streams. You're going to Iceland, as we've talked about. Have you travelled much for fishing? Very little, really. I've been privileged to fish in Scotland on the Helmsdale, where I caught a spring salmon, uh, sea lice on it. That was a magic experience. Um, I fished a fair bit in Ireland, um, fished on the Corrib in the spring for the duck fly, which is quite a magic thing. But it's interesting, you can spend a lot of money and travel a long way, and the fishing is not always absolutely magic. Um, I had a week on Corrib when you couldn't fish for half the week because there was a howling gale, um, snow on the mountains in, in March. It's, <laughs> it's an interesting experience. So uh, I'm reluctant to spend too much and go too far. There's no place like home, right? You're, you're dead right. And I love the streams. I'm very lucky. Ten minutes from my door, I'm on the River Ottery. And for an evening there in the summer when there's spinners, egg laying and, and mayfly spinners in the air and sedges around, it's magic fishing. It really is magic fishing. So Iceland is on that radar. But is there somewhere that you've read about or you thought about and thought, do you know what? That sounds really cool. I think the only thing that I would aspire to is is saltwater fly fishing in somewhere like the Caribbean or, or, or even better, the Seychelles or something crazy, which is silly money, but I'm sure it's great fun. And, and I've spoke to many people who do it, and it, it sounds like a magic experience. But you hook a nice bass on a... You don't need to fish a heavy rod. You can fish a five or a six-weight rod. Um, 
you will get a good fight from the past. And if you hook a mullet, you will know all about it. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like we're only really scratching the surface at the moment. But I wondered, as we start to wind up now, what would you tell that young David Pilkington who first walked through the doors of the Arundel in 1968? Is there any advice you'd have given him now? I think I was probably uh, too reticent. Um, there were people who invited me to fish places and I felt, well, I can't really do that and it's a bit much to do. But, I mean, I have been invited and been to fish places. I fished the chalk streams as a guest of our hotel guests and, indeed, I fished in Scotland and Ireland with hotel guests. Um, but I never took advantage of it and perhaps, you know... Um, with the wisdom of hindsight, I, sh I should have been a bit more grasping and greedy, but perhaps I am where I am anyway. And that's a nice thing to have as well. I'm still going through this spell now of just trying to say yes to anything. If somebody says, oh, do you want to come and fish a local river? I'll, I, I try very hard to do that because the seasons go quickly now, don't they? Sadly, the seasons do go quickly and you, 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 you become aware of the fact that you are not immortal. So these days are increasingly precious. And so the season's underway here now. What are your hopes for this one? Are they, as they always are, just have good fun, good fishing and a, a few rising trout? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the one thing certain right now is that the amount of water in the ground will hold a good level in the rivers for some time into the future. Um, I pray we don't get another drought like we did in 2022 when we actually had to stop fishing because of high water temperatures and concerns for the fish's welfare. Um, I hope for a good one of sea trout. I hope to see a few salmon. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed indeed. Um, we have a list of uh, songs, and it's called the Fly Culture Podcast Road Trip something or other. I can't remember what I called it now. Is there a song that you love to listen to that I can add to that list? Oh, Lord above. I would have to say no. I'm not <laughs> greatly into music, so... I won't go there. The sound of the river, eh? Yeah, the river sound, the birds, the singing of the birds. I mean, I love to hear, you know, a kingfisher whistling as he calls past. That's beautiful. I think that's the best answer we've had so far. So thank you for that. Um, David, it's been <laughs> wonderful to catch up with you. It's been wonderful to see around the tackle shop at the moment. I'm like a kid in a sweetie store at the moment. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, what are you... Or your social media handles. What is your Instagram um, handle? Uh, Pilks Flyfish is Instagram, and the email address here is david at thearundel dot com with two L's in Arundel. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. It's been lovely to sit down and talk about fishing with you. You have such a wonderful reputation down in the West Country. I know so many people will be thrilled to hear your words on here and hear what your thoughts are. So please keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. David, it's been great to speak to you. Thank you for being a guest on the Fly Culture Podcast today. My pleasure. And you'll have to come fishing with me soon. I would like that very much. We might even drag you up to the tour. You're on. <laughs> Everyone, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. As always, there'll never be any charge for these. We just hope you enjoy this one and all the other episodes that we've released. Thanks so much for listening. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly published magazine owned and run by fly anglers. When it comes to fly fishing, we've got you covered. Mm -hmm.